Good afternoon. Thank you for coming out. It's a pleasure to be with you all again today. Um, I know that uh, originally my partner, Chris Bartell, was supposed to be here. Uh, he had worked uh, six, over six years for Bass, Bigelow, uh, Aerospace, Advanced Aerospace uh, Space Studies for on Skinwalker Ranch for over six years. The good thing is a lot of what we've recently found and uh, some new discoveries uh, will be on this presentation. I'd say about 95% of this presentation is brand new, so if you've seen uh, what I've presented here before, yeah, you're gonna be glad to know it's not the same thing. As a matter of fact, uh, in January, I was up there for the first time uh, filming in the winter. So we were filming up till two or three in the morning in negative seven to nine below zero, which was quite the experience. I'd never uh, been up in northeastern Utah in the winter, and uh, I hope we stick to summer filming from now on, because it was cold. I don't think I could put enough on. Um, that filming was for a different uh, show other than The Secret of Skinwalker Ranch. It was for uh, one of Josh Gates' shows. So uh, that should hopefully be out here in the late spring, possibly early summer. So what's been going on lately in northeastern Utah? UAP sightings, magnetic anomalies, plasma events, some very exciting experiments, and accidental ancient history of what took place in the past. Much of this happening at or around Skinwalker Ranch. I was recently again back on there in January. Quick geography for those of you that uh, aren't too familiar with uh, Skinwalker Ranch in the area. It's important. So right here, is the ranch, and I'm gonna go into a little bit more uh, detail. This is the mesa that you hear about, probably more important than the ranch itself. You have the Ute Reservation, Bottle Hollow Reservoir, which plays a part in all the high strangeness occurring. Up here, you would have uh, Roosevelt. Down here is also another important site. It's known as Space Wolf Research. It's on the southern adjacent border to Skinwalker Ranch. And remember that the, the paranormal and the phenomena, you know, doesn't stop at borders that were recently created. So it's, it's the entire area. Uh, but it is important to know that down here and up here just as important as right here. So this geomagnetic survey provides the boundaries of the ranch. You're looking at magnetic field differences on the property that were taken using a magnetometer attached to a drone. It's interesting how this portion was carved out, became part of the ranch. So it be, during the course of the history, it's been anywhere between 480 acres. You'll have read that in one of the prior books. This added the five, made it 512. The uh, property, if uh, you don't know, no longer owned by Robert Bigelow. It's an, uh, owned by Brandon Fugel. And he has it under the Adamantium Corporation. Oh yeah, also what I wanted to discuss was right here, Homestead 2. Uh, if you, who's watched the show? One or two people, okay, good. So Homestead 2 right here, what you didn't hear in season two and three was they kind of didn't discuss what the colors mean. When you see this deep, deep red in the middle of green and blue, that's something highly magnetic below ground, shouldn't be that way, but directly underneath the site. You have up here too where the cattle seem to be interacting with these uh, UAP. And then right here, and we'll get into this more, is the triangle. And that blue signifies a void or a cavern system underground. So uh, in season two when I discussed with Eric and uh, Dr. Taylor, about the triangle, what I had located and found was all this missing soil underground, that it was this void. But let's go over some history. Before we ever heard about Skinwalker Ranch and before Robert Bigelow and NIDS, which was the National Institute for Discovery Sciences, began investigating there, Bigelow owned another ranch filled with high strangeness. 
This location is Mount Wilson Ranch. That spot was in far eastern Nevada. Now, all these photos of the NIDS team were never seen until I released them on my YouTube channel in November of 2022. The source was a NIDS employee that still wants to remain anonymous. Bigelow found out about the location from a government informant that had been working on a secret MX missile program that was to have underground train systems carrying our nuclear missiles. It was to keep enemies of the United States from targeting our missiles before launch. Apparently, part of this underground project was to take place underneath Mount Wilson itself. The time period was late 1980s to approximately late 1991, beginning in 92. The ranch is just outside of Pioche, Nevada, down here. Mount Wilson is right up here. What's interesting is Mount Wilson used to look like this. It seems like the entire top was taken off of it sometime in the 1980s to make this. Now, when the government was supposedly clearing out the mountaintop to build the underground secret site, ancient artifacts were located and removed by the federal government. Mummies and other classified objects were also removed. As a matter of fact, if it were not for the informant tipping off Bigelow, no one would have known much about the site and the high strangeness apparently occurring to the military personnel while working there. Everything about the project would have remained classified. Robert Bigelow purchased the old ranch property and NIDS began investigating. The time period was just before Skinwalker Ranch became known to Bigelow. The land and buildings went back to the mid-1800s. It was a pickup and drop-off location for the stagecoach. Later, in the early 20th century, a saloon, parlor, and stopover boarding house were added. Bigelow purchased the property for a reason. He and Nids believed paranormal activity were taking place at the ranch. He also knew that the Native Americans considered the area sacred full of supernatural history that was passed down through many generations of the local Native Americans. The Paiute were one of these groups. The building in this photo is currently the motel for the property. The last room on the left was where Bigelow would stay when he owned it. Here it's where Bigelow saw an apparition of a male Native American that they would later label the shaman. I stayed at the same room when I was there, and unfortunately, none of this good stuff occurred. So. And I tried, tried to get something to happen. This is inside the room where Bigelow and myself stayed, where he saw the shaman. That's a lot of uh, luggage I had. I was actually in, in Utah for weeks before I went this, so I don't, I usually pack lightly. Look who shows up in the photos and on the ranch. We have Robert Bigelow himself, Jacques Vallée, and another member on the right, Colm Kelleher, who was the scientist that wrote Hunt for the Skinwalker with George Knapp. This was inside the saloon. Uh, remember that before Skinwalker Ranch, uh, as a matter of fact, Bigelow got the call about Skinwalker Ranch here at Mount Wilson. This is where everything started, where the hunt for Skinwalker would all begin, where similarities would be compared, where classified information was discussed, Matter of fact, I think he got the call in the saloon while they were all there about uh, northeastern Utah. Here we see Robert Bigelow inspecting the property with Colm. This was one of the first times that Robert and the NIDS team had walked the ranch. Um, not much has changed. This room looks almost identical to what you see here. And I believe this was uh, around 1994. Now this is a very interesting and telling photo. This billionaire and his scientists were very interested in this particular area near the ranch. We're aware of multiple historical artifacts found in the area since NIDS left. We're also aware of mines, structures, and certain anomalous energy spots on and around the ranch. Many staying at or visiting the ranch have observed or been affected by this unusual activity or events. Again, one of those was Bigelow himself seen in a Native American apparition. And it wasn't the first time that this apparition was seen. Uh, Bigelow had originally hired a archeologist to uh, go over the land, and prior to the team um, getting there, 
he came running out of the only building that was uh, set up for the people that were taking care of their, kind of startled him as a matter of fact that he saw this exact same shaman, um, I believe it was weeks before Bigelow ran into the same apparition or supposed apparition. This is another location on the ranch that NIDS conducted a lot of experiments and monitoring at. It's just northeast of the ranch buildings and you can see Mount Wilson in the background. Um, unfortunately, those documents that were given to me uh, were blacked out for this site. So I, I couldn't see you know, what they were looking into, but apparently it was the most important out of everything for that to have occurred. Here you see Jacques Vallée and another NIDS member in the meadow. So soon after the investigation started here, it quickly moved to northeastern Utah and Skinwalker Ranch. Before we get there, I want to go th through Portals of the Ancients because it plays into where we're going. So specific locations were chosen by ancient people as portal sites. Whether you believe these locations to only have symbolic meaning or other, such as an actual entry to another time, space, or interdimensional bridge is best left up to you, the individual. The point is, the sites themselves are real. They're all over the world, and they sure as heck were important to those living in the past. This specific carving was considered a portal feature to those living in Mesoamerica in the past. It's now located at the National Anthropology Museum in Mexico City. It originally sat on top of stone pillars and was considered a way to enter another realm. The shaman and priest cults were most likely those connected to these locations. Take a good look at this right here. Now check this out. So very similar symbol uh, seen in Mesoamerica and elsewhere in the world. If you look closely above, the glyph could be interpreted right up here as a doorway or an entry. Um, directly into the portal. Now this is McKee Spring Petroglyph Site in Dinosaur National Monument. It's on the Uinta Basin, which Skinwalker Ranch is on as well, very close to the ranch itself. Here's a close-up of the same petroglyph. So I often consider the possibility that what was occurring in the past can continue to occur. We need to work at understanding what was apparently known throughout the world in the past. It's this lost knowledge that should be examined with greater urgency than what we've been giving it. Now, when I teach or I present on the petroglyphs, I tell the audience that a single glyph could have different meaning to ancient cultures and people that existed throughout the world. The rock art is subjective. Anyone that tells you they know the meaning is guessing. It may be an educated guess based on other factors such as cultural sites near the glyphs and artifacts found at the site, but they do not know the exact meaning. Only the artist that created the glyph will know that. That being said, if one examines the entire panel, you may be able to make a more educated guess about the meaning. If you have multiple glyphs together, more information is available to assist in forming an opinion. Now, I also recommend looking around the area. Are there similarities between what is seen on the rock wall and what is in the environment around you? But if doing this, consider the fact that these glyphs were created hundreds if not thousands of years ago. What's around you may have changed since then. Another consideration is comparing oral traditions of indigenous people in the area, past and present, uh, considering that what has happened in the area has been documented by them, could this rock art be discussing a magnetic portal even in the past and like an, like an occurrence that has been documented in the area within the last 30 years? So where I'm going with this is, um, who's read the book by George Knapp and Colm Kelleher? They discuss on the ranch next door, it was the Garcia location, that Mr. Garcia stated that cattle were falling to their death. And the investigators from NIDS at the time were, well, how the hell is that possible? And they never saw anything. But as you continue to go through the petroglyphs and the pictographs that are located um, near Skinwalker Ranch, you have these interesting anomalous factors occurring over and over again. This specific rock art really shows what I'm leaning towards. You have this anthropomorphic feature with what appears to be a portal. 
If something were to enter it, you have it here with them falling upside down. These anthropomorphics. And then you have these abstract features that look to almost be, a lot of people will say they're cosmological, astronomical, but what if they're also discussing some type of um, magnetic or electromagnetic uh, energy that's causing these anomalies that could possibly be visible? And we're gonna get into that and I'm gonna show an example or two. Okay, so this is really interesting. Um, something energetic below the Uinta Basin affects what's above ground, what's out in space and elsewhere, maybe even a cause for temporal and spatial disruptions. Consider the fact that two bass security guards on Skinwalker Ranch chased a dire wolf in 2010 before it instantly vanished before them. New technology and the ancient historical records are two parts to hopefully solving this high strangeness puzzle. What you see in this photo appears to exist outside of our visual capabilities. This is above Skinwalker Ranch, visible using a new proprietary special 3D pixelation element software. I'm still learning about the technology and examining its practical features. Uh, Stephen Leah is the individual that's created the software. He has three physicists now working for him, and they're processing a lot of data that's coming through. Um, prior to this, the only available data with this software was through the, and this is what I'm told, through the NSA and the CIA. I'm still vetting all of that. Dr. Taylor has stated that he has worked with this individual and another uh, physicist that I know that I uh, presented with at another conference also has had uh, interactions with Stephen Leah. So what you're seeing is the triangle is somewhere down here. These features you can't see with infrared thermal visual, your eyes, but they exist and they're transient but they're constantly coming to this location. And this software, what it does is it pulls out all this, these pixels and dimensionalizes them in ways that it shouldn't be done, I guess, on two, 2D paper. Uh, and it's showing things that are there that are occurring. These features appear to have uh, electromagnetic and or magnetic capabilities. So again, I'm still trying to vet everything and still trying to understand the full development of the software. But the good thing is it's gonna start coming out and being mainstream within this year, and you're gonna start seeing it a lot more. And it's not weather, by the way. I've, I've had people ask me that, is it the weather pattern, is it the way? It's, it has nothing to do with that. That we have looked into. Is this the other end of a portal deep in space? We seem to have witnessed and documented a major plasma event in the sky above the ranch. Is this a charged particle event which is not understood, natural or unnatural? The other opening, one end of a tunnel, one that can only be seen and documented directly on or near Skinwalker Ranch in the mesa above it. Well, well, what does that mean? That would then mean that not understood event is targeted and not naturally occurring. And I want to update you all on an additional bit of high strangeness that took place above the triangle and the mesa. So what you're looking at is a two watt green laser light being pointed upward into the night sky. That laser light here should be continuing upward, but it's not. It was being stopped by an un seen object or event, cut off. If you look closely, something was also warping the laser into two different beams. And understand this was a clear night out, no atmospheric issues, visibility was excellent. It's being floated that something may very well be invisible or cloaked above the ranch in the mesa. I've added an additional possible reason what if we're looking at a gap being created, both spatial and temporal, because of something natural or not that is highly energetic, 
possibly even releasing ionizing radiation when the ends open up above the ranch. So individuals have been affected by ionizing radiation, which has damaged their skin, caused uh, brain injury. What if it's coming out of that more stable end of the event that we're seeing occurring um, out in space? And electrons, other types of ionizing radiation are coming through it as well. So one more time, is this the opening again or entrance to some type of spatial gap with the other end, the more stable end above the ranch at about one mile up in the sky? Should we be calling the anomalous region a portal or a gateway? Can what is taking place be creating the unusual RF radiation being investigated on the basin? It may be a byproduct of the event or something coming from the other side of the gap. And by gap, I mean energetic hotspots that appear to possibly be charged particle regions, at least the more stable end of the anomaly, meaning within the planet above the ranch. Consider the gap to be between places, both spatial and temporal. The registered signal is right around uh, 1.6 gigahertz. 1.647 seems to be uh, what's mostly showing up on the spectrometers and the dongles that are being used to monitor them anomaly above the triangle area of the ranch. Will distorting multiple signals at different bands make something show up, cloaked perhaps? Jamming the frequency ranges of one to three gigahertz might be an irritant for someone or something. How long have these energetic charged particle events been taking place? The petroglyphs here are very important to what was happening on the Uinta Basin in the past. Did we have a shaman cult in the area? Or were those living in the area experiencing what we would today label as high strangeness or paranormal activity? Many times we notice that the high strangeness is somehow connected to the stars and other cosmological features. Were the shaman in contact with other beings they knew as the star people? Next time you view ancient petroglyphs, pictographs, figurines, megalithic structures, and artifacts, keep an open mind to what they look like compared to technology that we're now aware of. If it looks like it can fly or seems to be wearing advanced clothing, maybe it really was. Okay, so let's move to another topic. Have shapeshifters been to the ranch that's named after them? That's an iffy maybe at best. But what if even the skinwalkers and shapeshifters of Mesoamerica and the desert southwest are all based upon what was taking place in Utah thousands of years ago? Remember that many of the past Mesoamerican groups are related to the Native Americans based in this area. We can see this in the Udo Aztecan language spoken through what is today the United States, Mexico, and several other Central American countries. The Shoshone Indians lived in Northeastern Utah prior to any Ute tribe or other bands of Native Americans. They have the longest ties to the area after the collapse of the Fremont culture. The Shoshone are also the closest thing to original Proto-Aztecan people since they never migrated far away. Uh, I think it's unfortunate that a lot of our information is currently coming from just the Ute tribe uh, people don't quite understand that the Ute have only been in that area for about 165 years. They were actually in Colorado. Um, the original groups after the Fremont that were in this area were the Shoshone and the Paiute. And the Timpanogos is a band that unfortunately is on the Ute reservation. They've been lumped into the Ute and they're Shoshone, and they're fighting right now for their freedom to be rec uh, recognized by the United States government. There's only about 300 of them left, and they have the strongest ties to this phenomena that's occurring. Uh, a lot of their elders, if you're a treasure hunter, you know that Chief Wakara um, uh, played a huge part into the LDS, uh, the Mormon church moving into that area, and we'll touch upon that a little bit. So I think that 
my biggest objective out of everything is getting all the shows that come into this area to understand the real history behind the Uinta Basin and the Uinta Mountains and that we're asking the wrong group the questions that need to be answered and we need to shift that to the right people because their oral traditions have a lot more information that y you look at and you're like, man, this, this deals with, you know, giants. It deals with paranormal activity. It deals with uh, the Spaniards. Just, just a ton more involvement of what occurred in the past. So the legend of these mystical shapeshifters have many layers and variants. In Mesoamerican mythology, the Nahual refers to a person with the power to transform him or herself into an animal, commonly a jaguar, a puma, or a wolf. Remember that the Navajo that are associated specifically with the skinwalker lore of Utah were one of the last groups migrating to the desert southwest. They originated from the northern reaches of North America. The Aztec, Toltec, and Maya were here in the desert southwest well before the Navajo, migrating back and forth because of multiple cataclysmic events and extended droughts. These Nahuatl groups had to play a part in the Navajo borrowing the sympathetic magic to protect themselves from the violent groups around them who were upset that the Navajo moved into the area and started a systematic takeover of the region. Certain symbols and music being used together appear to be a big deal in how these supernatural powers work in the real world. So we're talking about vibration and frequency shift if you really think about it. Um, it's amazing how the world of physics is finally starting to realize that everything is a shift in frequency, vibration, amplitude changes. It's the science is matching you know, the history uh, what a lot of people would have considered pseudoscience. And you have to remember that a lot of pseudoscience leads to major discoveries that eventually bring the scientists to, to check and see if it's for real. A were jaguar was first. This eventually morphed into a werewolf, like being the skinwalker's favorite form. Now, I don't believe this was always mythology, oral tradition of Native Americans and Mesoamerican state otherwise. It was the white anthropologists that had trouble believing the truth and turned everything into folklore and mythology. Okay, so I wanna go into Utah's connections to Mesoamerica. This is a great way to do it. This is a French edition of Mexican-born cleric and scientist Jose Antonio de Alzate y Ramirez's map of Mexico, published in Madrid and the year's important, 1768. So why am I showing you this? Well, check this out. So in the 1700s, Europeans were aware of the true history of the Uinta Mountains and Basin. Modern day historians want you to believe that nothing was known about the Utah Territory area until 1776 with the Dominguez Escalante expedition. And remember, the map was in 1768. So they're showing that the homeland for these Mesoamericans was up in Utah. They knew about it. Now this came from Dr. Roger Blomquist. I'm tr still trying to gain access to this private ranch. He too believes that the Aztec were in Utah. This is an amazing petroglyph. It's on private property near Skinwalker Ranch. There appears to be an altar nearby the glyph. The anthropomorphic figure that's on the left appears to be holding what is known as a macana or a taino in Mesoamerican cultures. This was not used by the Native American Indians found in the desert southwest, at least that we know of. It is right here. Here you can see Aztec warriors holding a Makano. Uh, theirs was known as the Makwa Huitl. The Makano was known uh, as their sword. It had razor sharp obsidian pieces placed around the outer edges to slash open the enemy. Now the reason that they lost, by the way, to the uh, conquistadors was imagine this hitting an iron sword. 
it broke the obsidian right off of it. Geomagnetic anomalies. So I've located transient alternating, alternating magnetic field anomalies below ground running across the mesa, the triangle of Skinwalker Ranch, and the south end adjacent ranch. When I initially presented my evidence to Eric Bard, who is the lead scientist at Skinwalker Ranch, I explained that my belief was that the readings show something transient and highly energetic below ground. Its path is shown here in the red line, right here. So initially, I didn't have access here to the ranch, and over the course of a long, long time, I took about 3,600 readings in this area. And I came, these were the first two that were located. Up here is the Bottle Hollow Reservoir. Now, in the 1980s, around 1986, this massive uh, power line system was put in right here that goes across. It's half a million plus kilovolts. This was third that I found on the uh, southern adjacent property, and then when I was on Skinwalker Ranch, we found a fourth one right here, and that's the triangle. Research has shown that some ant species are capable of detecting electromagnetic fields and may even use the Earth's magnetic field as a directional cue as they search for food or nest sites. Their attraction to man-made electrical devices may be an accidental evolutionary byproduct of this natural ability. Electric fields were the only parameter which consistently attracted ants, and that's ants of all three subfamilies responded in a similar manner. Well, the most southern magnetic data point that I showed you earlier is also immediately next to the largest dang anthill that I have come across on the basin. Right here, it's massive. And they never migrate away from it. They're always there for years and years. A lot of times they abandon and move elsewhere. Heck no. So quickly, this is the, um, the fence line that separates Skinwalker Ranch from uh, Space Wolf Research. This is the magnetic anomaly right here. And I'm going to discuss what qualifies it as such in a little bit. I want to show you something that happened here. So it gets stranger. Lightning. Lightning struck right here. It skipped across the ground, burning plants and weeds in its path as it arced to an RV and house structure 112 feet away. Did a little damage, right? This happened in 2021. Ladies and gentlemen, that's incredible when you think about it. Lightning hitting solid ground and then somehow arcing elsewhere. And why was it even interested in that spot? Why was it directed there? Now, these were the replacement structures after the fire. Notice that an 8,000-pound shipping storage container was set parallel to the new building. The container now occupied the old recreational vehicle space. So this is a shipping container. It is where this RV was. This is the only thing that survived. Got its back end burned a bit. So one, one more time, new building, shipping container. This is how the container was found on a Sunday morning in September of 2022. The owner of the ranch had no idea how the container moved perpendicular to the building. The property owner immediately contacted myself and our team. You can see where it was laying before. And I've known this individual that owns the property for years. Our investigative team spent an entire day, about 14 hours, searching for tire tracks from a forklift-type vehicle or where a crane would have locked itself into position 
to move an 8,000 pound container? Nothing, zero. And it's soft dirt, you would have seen it. You would have seen um, a larger vehicle that would have brought the forklift driving up, nothing. We went and we interviewed neighbors to ask about the potential of a helicopter having been used to move or lift the container. No one saw or heard anything. Notice too in this photo, if a crane or helicopter were used to move the container, it would have caused some major damage to the building, possibly swinging, being swung right into it. Look how, I mean, look at this. There's not even an inch of gap in between the house and the container. There are two little minor spots that look like it might have rubbed up against it at one point, but it was minimal damage. Again, another photo of just how close this was. Lower minor damage at the base and toward the roof of the house structure obviously was present. I want everybody to make sure that we did find something, showed that it was apparently that it had touched into the building. This one's really good. I mean, look at that. Look at this gap. How do you drop something that close without taking out a wall? Now I also want to talk about another site. This sacred site location was shown to us by a Ute in his early 20s. The Ute have been going to this location for about 165 years. Remember, they're fairly new to the area. The mound, this location right here, this mound, it's, it's difficult to see. It only rises probably about 10 inches higher than the rest of the area. Uh, the mound is 10 feet away from that replaced building and storage container. The Ute informant stated that in the past, the Ute leaders would fast for several days, then meditate and pray while watching Skinwalker Ridge in front of them for supernatural signs and occurrences to take place. Uh, the ridge, this is, skin, this is Skinwalker Ridge. It's the southernmost part of the Mesa north of Skinwalker Ranch. So interesting for me is the fact that this Ute informant was telling this to a group of people that I had nothing to do with and I just so happened to be uh, at the location site when he was explaining what would go on in the past. This spot, again, happened to be directly behind the largest magnetic anomaly that I've located on the Uinta Basin. Same spot with the Ant Hill and Lightning Strike. So what was seen and heard by those Ute leaders in the past was sacred. However, some of what took place was shared with the tribe. One thing that was made known was that divine spirits would exit gateways entering our world. The Ute informant telling us the story was not being given money or other payment for a story. It was being given freely. I understand it's still secondhand knowledge, but the site that he showed and the location pointed out on Skinwalker Ridge fits with other information I know and the magnetic field variations that have been taken. So again, remember, it doesn't uh, adhere to boundaries that we've put up. Here's another carved glyph. Uh, could this be the work of the 9th Black Cavalry Buffalo Soldiers in the late 19th century? 96% of those Buffalo soldiers stationed at Fort Duchesne were Freemasons. Why put the carvings here at what is now Skinwalker Ranch? The location was approximately one mile from the fort. Or could this have been the work of the Spaniards or Mexican miners that were mining the area since the 1500s, signifying a treasure or something else of tremendous value around the Mesa, in the Mesa, under the Mesa? That's Tom Winterton, by the way, from uh, the show. Oh yeah, real quick. So I know it's hard to see. Uh, obviously, the, it's backwards. If you, if you notice the square and compass kind of lays backwards than what it normally would be. We have a, a side that looks to be pointing and right here, and I'll show a drawing of it, is a circle within a circle, which is again important 
in treasure hunting, mining, and with Freemasonry. So this is the drawing of the carving to show you that circle within a circle, another prominent part of the Freemason culture. But this is also what I'm talking about with the other possibility. It originating from the Spaniards. The carvings could mean a treasure is hidden nearby. And remember that the Mesa and Ridge looked to have had mining operations at both locations. Large chunks of the Mesa seem to be missing. And uh, I don't know how much I'm supposed to say. So yeah, I better stop there. Large parts of, ch it's, it's missing parts. I better, yeah, stay tuned. Caves, tunnels, and voids are all throughout that mesa. I know firsthand I've been in some of them. Now, thanks to Trey Hudson, who was here a few months ago and spoke to us. Uh, remember from the Meadow Project in uh, the Alabama area? There's another possibility of understanding the meaning of the carving. We can see that the pointed arm on the irregular compass and square give us a direction to search. Using the circle within the circle and its positioning within the compass and square, Trey has potentially narrowed down the direction where one must travel. But what about distance? The second clue or key to finding what's hidden was photographed by Chris Bartell. Again, Chris was bass security for Robert Bigelow on the ranch for a little over six years. After researching the location, this rock appears to have been purposely altered and is what we believe the second marker to triangulate coordinates up on the mesa. Finally, another partner of mine, Ryan Skinner, located numbers embedded into the mesa. The number two appears to be 314 feet away from the compass square carving. So now is pi embedded in the distance. That's what we're still looking into. There's also a number five and a number eight up on, on there. Here comes the unfortunate part. Three different parties are claiming ownership of the area that the markers are pointing toward. Uh, so we have Skinwalker Ranch, the ranchers that own much of the Mesa, and the Ute tribe claiming ownership. So that makes the area off limits for now, possibly permanently. So uh, if you saw last, at last season, they had that uh, circle stone right over here, the sacred stone. Everything seems to be pointing, triangulating to that point. Okay, I want to go into the next topic, giants. For an anthropologist, a basic interest is to know who a group of people were and why those people do what they do. For the archaeologist, a great way to determine these patterns of behavior and their causes are by investigating the material remains of behavior repeated over multiple generations. So if you listen to modern day academia, they make you believe they have all the answers. If anyone steps out of line or says something that gets off the path of how humans evolved in the past, you're attacked, you're made to appear incompetent among the general public. This is BS. Native Americans are the first to discuss and tell you that the history about giants or people of great stature are real. Their oral traditions are real history to them and speak specifically about these beings. They state it's not mythology but reality. The Native Americans will tell you it's the European descent white social scientists that tried to change this and continue to incorrectly decode their past. It's the early anthropologists that attempted to create a European narrative and continue to feed this crap to their students who repeat the fallacies to the next generation of scientists that believe they know all the answers. They're the ones who have damaged the real forgotten history of those that were here in the Americas, those of great stature that were once considered the original gods throughout the world. And yes, the Fremont culture were Native Americans of average size that saw and interacted with beings of great stature. Whoever these post-desert archaic Indians were that were labeled as Fremont by anthropologists and created the artifacts of the giants such as the ones that you see here. 
These same ancient people created the petroglyphs and pictographs showing that two factions of these giants were warring among each other, headhunters as a matter of fact. At a much earlier period, these giants may very well have been considered the gods to the ancestors of these Fremont people. So in prior presentations, I've shown migration patterns of these giants that were coming in and out of present-day United States. The giants were funneling in and out of Mesoamerica. Those giants or their ancestors were originally traveling the world, searching for minerals, metals, and other substances to mine. They were traders of commerce around the world. At a much earlier time period, the original people of great stature may even have had technology that would have been considered advanced to the average humans around them. Could some of this technology still be underground at the Uinta Basin and under the Uinta Mountains? I believe it's possible. But until recently, there was no absolute connection between these large statured individuals and Skinwalker Ranch, home to much phenomena and home to secrets still buried below ground. Until now. This amazing discovery was made directly at Skinwalker Ranch. It was located and recorded using LIDAR cameras, which are light-directed and ranging lasers. The one anthropomorphic figure on the left has six digits on the hands. The giants of the past have a documented history of having been with six digits on each hand, polydactly. The figures also appear similar to how the vernal-style Fremont carved and pecked these larger-than-life beings. I'm sure this is going to be talked about a lot more here in the next month or so. What's unique about this figure from other vernal-style trapezoidal anthropomorphs is that the tunic, or the breastplate, has two large squares instead of an upsilon symbol or two rectangles around the shoulders like all the other carvings throughout northeastern Utah. I believe each part of this panel needs to be broken down, documented, and then compared to other rock panels throughout the Uinta Basin. So what the giants were doing at the ranch may very well be tied into what's in the mesa north of the ranch. I think there's a real good possibility that people knew for a very long time that an unknown group was mining for something or had something underneath the mesa. And that got passed on to the desert archaic Indians, then it was passed on to the Native Americans who were unfortunately tortured by the Spaniards and conquistadors and gave up that information. It was passed on to the Mexicans after they gained their independence. And at some point, what's there was lost. Um, is it technology? Maybe. But again, these are the squares right here. So this is either some type of leader of these people of great stature, or now we're looking at a third group. So the vernal style Fremont were unique. Uh, they had certain features in their petroglyphs not found anywhere else. Does this mean that those living here in the past were a completely different group than what was found in the rest of the desert southwest? Maybe it means there were other groups on the basin that were so different that the Fremont felt the need to create a historical record of their interactions with these large statured beings. Um, I'm five foot 11. This is uh, well over six feet tall, six uh, fingers on each massive feet. The petroglyph is known as Bigfoot. Here it is again from a different angle. So here's something even more interesting about those living on the Uinta Basin area in the past. The Uinta Fremont population are unique. Burials from about 300 common era to 1,050 common era exhibit cranial deformation characteristics and stand apart as a group from other Fremont populations. Some of the Uinta Basin burials exhibit cranial deformation caused by binding infants to cranial boards. This trait is absent from the archaic and the basket maker too before them. It's virtually absent in all other Fremont populations. The information comes from prior professor of anthropology at Utah State University, Logan, Dr. Stephen R. Sims. So who were they simulating? What did the local Fremont population see or interact with that required the simulation of skull elongation to take place? I mean, look at this. 
That answer is all around us on the Uinta Basin. You need only go to McConkey Ranch to see it. This is at McConkey Ranch. But now you can apparently also go to Skinwalker Ranch. Real quickly, I wanted to throw this in, documented of elongated skulls in the 19th, 20th century. Kind of go back here. A lot of similarity. I didn't, by the way, paint over the petroglyphs. This was all photoshopped. They'd be pretty upset, right? These were two ways that the skull elongation was being done in the Americas. Again, what did they see that made them want to simulate the elongated skull? Most likely to bring certain elite classes of people closer to resembling the gods. And remember, the world started with the giants. Many cultures and civilizations clearly documented and believed this. Why then are we not taking the investigations into the matter more seriously at the academic level? I'm hoping to bring you greater details and information about the petroglyphs on the ranch very soon. You know, also, real quick, too, in this photo, if you haven't noticed, the letter T was extremely important to the Mesoamerican culture. And we will get into it, too, about Tamuan Khan. So a lot of you have heard about Aztlan. Aztlan is the home where the, uh, the Aztecs came from, which is in Utah. But Tamuan Khan is origin, origin for everyone on this side of the world that they believe in. And this Tamuan Khan is known by different names. Uh, the treasure hunters in Utah may call it Ker Shinab or Kerry Shinab. So it's, it's just important. You have this constant interaction of oral tradition, history, everything, in and out of the desert southwest, Mexico, Central America, all the way down to Peru. Tons of this interaction. Commerce, commerce was huge. Think of the, the giants. If they were seafaring, the Phoenicians knew something or came across some type of information about their routes because where did they end up? They ended up in Malta, Sardinia, we have a ton of Phoenician glyphs in the petroglyphs and pictographs all throughout the desert southwest. You have these stories about the Phoenicians uh, dropping off in Veracruz, Mexico, and traveling all through Mexico and then up into the desert southwest, and then intermingling, and you, know, you have these lighter-skinned uh, individuals. The, the Pima Indians, I don't know if you know this, have 5.6% DNA of Sardinian in them, 5.6%. How is that possible unless it was somewhere in the past, you know, a long, long time ago? So, um, for the last six years, I've followed the underground water and geomagnetic field anomalies throughout the Uinta Basin and the Uinta Mountains. During September 2020, I was at Skinwalker Ranch and continued my magnetic field research that led me to the triangle on the ranch. It was during the season two of History Channel's show that I explained to the Skinwalker Ranch team that I believed running water was directly below the mesa and the ranch. This was showing up in voids below ground and transient magnetic field variances of approximately 40 microtesla. A majority of those magnetometer readings were in a straight line down from Bottle Hollow Reservoir past Skinwalker Ranch's south field line. So this is the triangle right here. So, so much is currently taking place above and below the triangle at the ranch. Um, again, it's, it's, it's a feature that's been created by mostly the roads that were put in there, but for some reason, it's uh, one of the three most energetic areas available on the ranch. So here's the running water found below ground when the Skinwalker Ranch team drilled below the triangle at the same location where I showed there was a major difference in the local magnetic field readings. And those were transient, moving from a negative micro, uh, 14 microtesla to about a mid-80 microtesla. So those numbers should not happen at the same spot on our planet ever. Uh, the lower reading usually defines a cavern or other void below ground. The increase to an 80 plus microtesla shows something heavily magnetic uh, suddenly below the exact same ground. 
Now, both readings, again, they should not appear below uh, the collection site. It, it just shouldn't be, unless there's possibly water involved. As the team drilled deeper, the water volume increased and water appeared to be moving in a southern direction, uh, direction below the ground. There was so much running water that the drilling rig became vulnerable to collapse into the void that was forming below. And unfortunately, the drilling had to be discontinued at 25 feet. The original drill depth was supposed to be 100 feet. And that depth uh, has yet to be done. Uh, as a matter of fact, nobody's drilled since then at that location. Interesting is that I believe there to be two levels of running water below ground. One is shallow. The other is deep, approximately 1,000 feet plus. The greater depth coincides with what was located below ground up in the Uinta Mountains and north of the Ute Reservation. Deep underground may very well be an ancient river. Uh, here you can see voids that have formed where the drilling took place and the pipe casings were placed. Again, if you'd seen my uh, prior presentations, um, there's a lot happening deep underground, all the way from the mountains, which start approximately four or five miles north of Skinwalker Ranch. And then consider what's directly north of the Mesa and Skinwalker Ranch. It's been there since 1970. We're talking about Bottle Hollow Reservoir. I've been told by two separate sources that have been scuba diving into the reservoir that very large sinkholes or at the bottom of the reservoir. Does this mean that water forced into a canyon has found its way below ground into a deep cavern system that has been there for thousands of years and according to oral traditions from the Paiute and the Shoshone were used in the past by humans and only recently inundated with water. That water, by the way, is moderately saline and has high levels of magnesium. This makes the water deep underground running through the cavern system hard water meaning there are high amounts of mineral ions. And I've shown this before, uh, but I think it's important enough to show again. On July the 12th of 2006, a subaqueous explosion was captured during a flyover by a United States government agency. Now I've discussed this in multiple presentations here to MUFON. I included the history of the event and that we did verify the photos and lighting with that specific government agency. So there must be some sort of energy resonance coming up from the bottom as a repeating energy pulse. If a sub-bottom hole or cave releases gas from something generating the gas in the cave, then it might build and suddenly erupt, causing a repeating pulse of ripples at the surface. This is another piece of evidence for an underground cavern system, and by the way, this is almost three quarters of a mile from one end to the other. Now the Mesa above Skinwalker Ranch has entrances and sinkholes. I probably shouldn't be showing you, but I've personally been to them. The sinkhole on the north end of the Mesa can be seen on Google Earth if you go back on the date slider. There's also other ways of going underground this is obviously my least favorite way. <laughs> the, you know, this is what it takes. So I'm 5'11", and the only thing, you have to put your hands out in front of you and pull with your, your fingers. That's all you can use. You, and a little bit of your uh, feet you're able to use too, but it, it's probably about eight feet in length and takes about three or four minutes to get through because of that. And yeah, my wife is turning her head right now because she's claustrophobic. I, I don't know, I love it, it's fun. This is what it looks like on the other side. Curiously, that that sinkhole at the north end of the Mesa, it can be seen by going back again on that date slider on Google Earth, is directly below those half a million kilovolt plus power lines running east and west on the Mesa. So are electromagnetic fields playing a part in having an interaction with the water below ground to excite the phenomena at Skinwalker Ranch? This happened last year. About six of them just suddenly caught fire. Uh, actually, the, it took about the whole day to put the fires out. 
Now, I think that a big part of the issue, a lot of people were saying, oh, this is the paranormal. I don't think the company is uh, cleaning them correctly. So there's a lot more energy being released and in a violent manner than it should. And I think that they really need to do a better job of upkeep and it might help, but maybe it is. Maybe it's exciting what's occurring uh, south of them because these are directly across the Mesa. The closest one is 1.08 miles from the northernmost portion of Skinwalker Ranch. And notice too, the karst voids that travel great distances within the Mesa. These voids were used, uh, located with a 3D geo surveying magnetometer attached to a drone. This also points towards limestone and quartz common with the Mesa. That limestone obviously great for caves to be created. Okay, so one piece of high strangeness captured at Skinwalker Ranch dealt with the Skinwalker Ridge and Mesa mysteriously lighting up. In 2019, the phenomenon was captured on film and shown in season one of the show that airs on the History Channel. On the Mesa, mysterious lights cascaded in a wave across portions of the southern region. Some of the desert lit up while others remained dark. It occurred just before 2 a.m. Now I've been on the ranch during those early morning hours and let me tell you, the area is pitch black. You cannot see your hand in front of your face unless you have a flash, flashlight. So what was the high strangeness? The cascading light phenomenon is on amazing, it's an amazing sight to witness. Is it a paranormal event? And if not, how could it have happened? Well, let's discuss that. So you had this, this wave of lights going across at night, and it was uh, multiple colors. Now, after two years of testing several different hypotheses, I believe that we've found the true reason why this occurs. And you're looking at one of several variables required to make the phenomenon take place. There are certain dark colored rocks found all over parts of the mesa, hematite and iron oxide. When viewing the rocks during the daytime, they just have a minor shine to them, nothing that would make one believe that they could light up a hillside in the middle of the night. Here's a close up. Now this is the window that I'm looking out of. It's in Chris Bartell's uh, vehicle, his truck. It had UV filtered tint. Those are the rocks on the mesa. The double polarized filters of our sunglasses on our face and looking out of the tinted windows caused all the rocks to shine this extremely bright purple, blue, and pink with the noonday sun beating down on the mesa. Unfortunately, I could not capture the effect uh, on my GoPro camera since I, well, I wasn't able to get that second filter through it. Now, as one moves their head or as the truck was moving, it appeared during the day that outside was this sea of brilliant colors like these moving waves across the ground. The only problem was what was the light source in the middle of the night that could make this effect on the Mason Skinwalker Ridge? How could the rocks be lit in such a large area as was seen in season one of the television show? And what was mimicking a filter to the light? Now, the Skinwalker Ranch area is pretty much surrounded by the oil and gas industry. Uh, I separated it here with the, the red line. You have the ranches, and then all of this is oil and gas uh, being taken out of the ground. You can see all the sites here, and then all their roads that lead out. The main roads that they use, I've marked with a one and a two. And then again, uh, right here, the ranch. The ranch starts right about here, Skinwalker Ridge. Here's a photo of an extended oversized semi-truck using the main roads. Well, late one night I watched these trucks and monitored the Mesa. I observed what had to be one of the trucks traveling on one of the two roads to the southwest of the ranch. And it had what I believe were xenon bulb headlights with the high beams on. When it turned onto a north-south road, the lights from the truck created the Mesa lights to appear and seemed like a wave of lights were traveling across the Mesa and Skinwalker Ridge. The effect that I observed was not as large as what was captured in 2019, but it may be because of the location that I was, was at. 
Since I was just west of Skinwalker Ranch property, I believe I was only able to observe the initial west side of the mesa light up before it continued away from me. I also believe that the portion of the road the truck was at was slightly higher in elevation than the fields in front of the ranch. These are those xenon high intensity discharge bulbs. They're called HIDs. They put off this blue tint. The lights appear to mimic the polarized filters used during the day to see the rock shine. Now I want to go into these one-offs, uh, certain things that have occurred. Um, I'm not sure how this happened with the photo taken here. So I got some type of double exposure. But how that is even possible using a digital camera, I'm not quite sure. I'm convinced that where this photo was taken is on top of one of three entrances into an ancient site that Mesoamericans called Tamuan Khan. We dis I discussed it a little bit with the T being sacred. Um, my whole journey up there, everything that's led me from my excavations and my work in Mesoamerica that has led to northeastern Utah is because of what I consider origin. I'm, I know a lot of people are looking for gold. Uh, they're looking for the paranormal, uh, for high strangeness. And I believe that everything is intermingled into this lost history that we have. And I truly believe that Tamawan Khan is somewhere in the Uinta Mountains. And I believe that they created stations and Skinwalker Ranch may very well have been one of those where they were uh, bringing things out of the mountains this way. And we're in a process of finding that, but I believe there's some type of uh, ancient depository where there may be records as well as uh, artifacts, including gold and silver. The um, treasure hunters, they've been calling it the Rhodes Mine or the Mormon Mine, Kershanab, Kerishanab. Uh, again, it's completely separate from Aztlan, which would be the home where the Aztecs, so the Aztecs would have left here uh, well before they were the, the Mexica, that's their real name, and would have gone westward. We now believe that Aztlan is actually on an island in the middle of the Great Salt Lake, so still in Utah. So I also had a lot of people look at this, including Mark D'Antonio. Eventually, we both agreed that I could have possibly been moving forward while zooming in on the phone's camera, and I thought that was a very reasonable explanation. However, I gave it a lot more thought, and I know that I was standing still and not zooming in. I even pulled up the metadata on the photo. I was at a f1.8 aperture, which is a wide opening, letting lots of light in and giving a fast shutter speed. This creates a shallow depth of field where only one part of a photo is in focus. And then that one 1,000th speed should be no motion blur. Notice, too, that there was no camera shake, if we just go back to it real quick. So there, I don't think I was moving. Um, what I'm getting at is, what if I captured, again, another magnetic field variance, another anomaly that we've been looking at just in a different way without uh, the scientific um, data from a magnetometer to do that. So we, we've been back quite a bit. We plan on going there. Unfortunately, if you look, the, it, this is a massive mound completely out of place in the Uinta Mountains at 11,010 feet. It is nothing but boulders. It, there's no solid ground. It's boulders for about 400 feet straight up the entire top. Extremely difficult to take any type of equipment up there with you. It's hard enough to get up there yourself. But what this is, is one of three artifacts that were supposedly stacked up and left by the Spaniards. A lot of people have come and asked or said that this is part of the Uinta Mountains, that they marked it that way. And we looked into that. And and the forestry and BLM said they would have never put three of these in a triangle together within 200 feet. It doesn't make sense to mark a trail that way. And they also said that it wasn't part of the Uinta Mountains uh, trailhead. And in 1880, in a journal from an, a Mormon member 
that was looking for gold, these were already there. And it actually plays into the lore of uh, the gold hunting. But I mean, I, I, tr I, I thoroughly believe that everything, again, is connected. But I try to stay as much in the science as possible, possible do, during this. But I mean, just look at that. It, it, it surely seems like something else is going on below ground. So again, I think everything is, is happening there underground and then working its way up. Now, what is found below and sampled can at times be perplexing. An example is my finding 66 parts per million iridium in locations not known to have had a meteor strike. Maybe that's because a meteor strike was long ago, possibly when Lake Uinta filled this area with the vast sea that encompassed parts of three states. So again, 66 parts per million. The, there's four meteor samples uh, in Utah. The greatest one shows 45 to 50 parts per million iridium from the known meteor strike sample.